and welcome to our Back to Homeschool series. My name is Laura Gonzalez. I am a realtor and co-founder of With Purpose Realty based in San Diego, California. I am very passionate about making education on wealth and smart living accessible to all, which is why I've designed this online series. Again, it's four parts tonight. It's our fourth part with a very special guest. So we have our very own Rabbi Lucci, who is our team's um, mortgage lender. So Rob, could you please give us a brief overview on your background and anything else you want to share? Sure. Hey, Lyra. Thanks for having me. So um, I am a licensed mortgage lender in the state of California. Uh, previously, still am a realtor, though Lara is our lead realtor on our team. Previously, in another life before real estate, I actually was in information technology. So I'm a trained IT project manager. Um, so it really has influenced the way that I run my pre approval process as well as our team process. Um, why don't you tell me about your background, Lara? Yes. So I am, like Rob mentioned, the lead realtor for our team. And I absolutely love real estate and love how rewarding it is to help people with their you know, biggest life dream. And before real estate, um, all of my career was um, with Fortune 500 companies such as Apple, Unilever, L'Oreal Paris, and all of it was doing sales negotiations and marketing, um, which is which are obviously very highly transferable skills in real estate. Sure. So um, before we get started, before we jump right into the conversation, just wanted to remind everybody tonight, we're going to be addressing topics like everything related to the pre-approval process. So Rob's going to take us through that. He's also going to talk to us about the HELOC process. So you're going to be learning about that as well. And then throughout the conversation, of course, we're going to be addressing the current state of the real estate market um, here in San Diego. So Rob, thank you again for being with us. Of um, we are so, so excited about tonight and let's kick it off with very, the very basic. So mm -hmm. what is getting pre-approved for a mortgage and why is it so important, especially for first time home buyers? Sure. So, so like Laura said, two topics tonight, right? Um, so the first one is pre-approval, <clears throat> excuse me, the, the black and white answer is you can't buy a home without being pre-approved, right? So whether you're pre-approved 30 days before 60 days, 90 days, at the end of the day, you have to be pre-approved. Pre so that's that's one side of the coin. The other side of the coin for specifically our first-time home buyers is, is about planning R, right? We want to make sure you have a stress-free, as much of a stress-free process as possible. So you can look at pre-approval, just like studying for a test, planning for a trip. It's, it's part of the process. And the sooner you do it, the sooner you knock out myths, you knock out insecurities, you knock out things that you might not know, you learn something. Um, so it's a really strong educational part of the process. I think the sad thing is historically the industry hasn't pushed it that way, right? It's always like, oh, you have to, you have to, you have to, which is true, right? But there really is a stronger argument to, it's a very, very important educational piece of the tool. I love that you bring that up because I think what we tell our clients always is this is the tool that's going to allow you to go into the process confidently and um, being informed about the decisions you're going to be making throughout the process. So thank you for sharing that. Before we dive into the um, actual pre-approval process, I wanted to just, I, could you help us address for potential buyers, what do they need to do to prepare themselves financially before they jump into that process of the pre-approval? Yeah, I mean, it, it's, I don't, for those who were part of the whole series, you brought in a financial advisor, right? So it kind of goes to that is, Budgeting, right? Um, a lot of times in a lot of areas in the United States, states specifically San Diego, mortgages a bit more than rent, right? So the thing is, you you want to know, you know, you're making this investment in yourself and in your future and in an asset, but how does that change your tactical day to day, right? You think of it strategically. Okay, I'm making this investment asset. Everyone tells you, oh, I wish I invested sooner, right? But you have to make sure it fits your day to day routine. So budget, budget, budget is the most important. Um, one tip I heard early in my career is. If you, you know, this why you get pre-approved early is you learn, well, what does this priced home mean on a monthly basis? And you can relate that to your current rent, right? So a lot of times if you're flying by the seat of your pants and you get pre-approved late, you're like, well, I, I think I can afford this. This, this seems right. I'm, I'm pretty sure, right? Wouldn't you want to know, right? So the, the tip I got early in my career is whatever you think you want to be at on a monthly terms, budget and live that way for three to six months. 
And then that's going to tell you very quickly, wow, I, I nailed it. I can, this is perfect for my budget or when I overstretched a little bit. So it, it really is about the budget at the end of the day. And, and a couple of questions come up. We're going to talk a little more in detail about the, the, the three letters CIA credit income assets. So when you ask me like what, what potential factors or things to prepare, it's all about credit income assets. And we'll, we'll jump into that. Yeah. Okay. Perfect segue. Can you tell us a little bit more about the actual pre-approval process, sure. what key steps are involved, and then what documentation do um, potential buyers need to gather to get that pre-approval application in? Okay. So so I mentioned credit income assets. So think of like the CIA prying into your information, right? It, we are talking about personal financial information, which is why you should work with someone you trust. It, it's a big deal. Um, so what we do is we essentially take a calculation between all three, merge it together and spit out a number in short, right? But how does that look as an end user, as a consumer uh, client? So realistically, you, you reach out to a lender, you speak to a lender, they have to give you an application. It's called a 1003 application. And it asks you all questions from what's your name, what's your social birthday, your job history, um, assets, et cetera. So that, that it, it's almost like a resume you're handing to us, right? And it is through that application and with your approval that we're able to run your credit. So our first step would be running through the application, kind of checking the box. Okay, this is their income, which is called stated, right? Because we need certain documentations to prove that. But once you get that to us, the credit report is so important. And this is one thing that people can be a little hesitant on. Um, but what it does is, one, it's going to give us a concrete number that will impact your approval in credit score. And it's also going to give us a concrete number of your monthly debt. So our monthly debt is based off what you owe to a creditor. So it's not your utility bill. It's not what groceries you bought at Costco. It's not what I went out and spent on beer, right? It's what you owe to a creditor that someone will come after you for. So we get those two key factors, right? We said credit, income, and assets. So debt falls under the income. You'll see how. Um then we collect your income at, your documentation. So are you a W-2 employee? Are you self-employed 1099, an S-corp, sole, sole prop? Whatever you might be, there are documentations proving how much money you make, right? So we take that into consideration. And then we ask you, well, what are you thinking to put down? And this is also a key question. People ask, how much do I need to? How much should I? And that's a conversation for a later day because it gets really deep. But that's why approvals are important because it's very personalized. So Based off the assets you have, you might say, I want X amount of savings or emergency fund. So we combine how much money you're putting down towards a house. We combine it with what money you make, the income you come in against the debt you have and your credit score. And those th three, four things together is what puts together the credit or excuse me, the pre-approval process. Yes. A little bit on the assets and the people that, mm -hmm. um, whatever you come in for the down payment, can you give us some options that people use um, to come up with that down payment money? Sure. So end of the day, think about it, it has to be liquid, right? So you're buying a house or a condo, whatever it is, you wire money towards the end of the process. It has to be liquid in some sense. So the most basic form are your checking and savings. Um, you can use your IRA, 401k. There's different rules and regulations between the two of them. You can use brokerage accounts. You can use uh, well, stocks and brokerage accounts. Um, a gift. A gift's a really big one. You have mom and dad, brother, sister, grandma. It's like, hey, like, I want to help you get off and take this as a gift. Take it, right? So there are uh, uh, varying things, but just know it has to be, at the end of the day, liquid assets. Great. Thank you. A lot of people... Um think that the credit score it's impacted impact impacted mm -hmm. negatively once you you run that for your approval can you tell us about that and how specifically does it actually yeah. impact it yeah i'm i'm always hesitant to answer this cuz I, I would honestly love to talk to someone who actually runs and and does the credit algorithm for mortgage scores right because i've heard anything from when i saw the industry no not at all to well a little bit and i don't think anyone truly knows here here's what you need to know when you run a true pre-approval, we are running a, um, a hard inquiry, meaning we're running your credit score, right? And amongst many factors, some things increase your credit score or help it, and some things decrease it or hurt it. So things that help it are you paid your bills on time. You, let's just say paid bills timely, right? That's a great example. Something that hurts it is a uh, number of inquiries, right? So what we're running is an inquiry. And for whatever reason, it's looked at as a negative thing towards a credit score. So if you've not run any inquiries and you go and you get pre-approved with three, four lenders, 
you're really going to be fine. If you've run 10 inquiries in the year already, because you bought a car and you were searching, you went five hard inquiries there, and then you're doing this and then run here, 10 inquiries will affect your credit score. And I can tell you looking personally, when I kind of monitor mine, you know, they go, oh, your inquiries are high. And I look, and it's like four in the year. I'm like, okay. You know, so I think the biggest thing also is that if you're worried about the inquiry impacting your credit score for purchasing, we probably have a little bigger problem of needing to increase your credit score, right? So whatever it might impact you on, it is a temporary thing because it, it goes away. Um, but I would not be afraid to be pre-approved by three or four lenders. And we'd, we'd be the first ones to tell you to shop and, and do your research, right? So not exactly a perfect answer, but that that is how it goes about. Yeah. And then I... Obviously, as a realtor, a lot of people come to me and say, what is that credit score that I need to be able to qualify? Yeah. Um, yeah. Can you just expand a little bit more on sure. that? Yeah, also not a straightforward answer. So there, <laughs> there's different loan programs. You can have as low as a 580. Again, maybe if at a 580, I wouldn't necessarily recommend like, hey, let's jump into a house. Let's kind of look at the whole spectrum. Maybe it makes sense. Maybe it doesn't. For A plus credit, they really call 760 A plus credit. Um your credit score affects multiple things. It affects your interest rate you can get, and it affects your mortgage insurance if you put less than 20% down. So think of it in like 20 to 40 point in, in, uh, increments. If you have an 800 versus 780, the credit, excuse me, the interest rate would be the same, but if you have MI mortgage insurance, it'd be a little better at 800, right? So it goes down kind of in 20, 40 increments, but I'd say 760 is really what I would consider personally for me shopping and looking at all the banks I shop at is, is A plus. 740 is great, um, but 740, 760 is where and above is ideal, A plus. Great. For those of you who joined us a little bit um, after the introduction, please feel free to drop any questions in the chat as we are talking through this session. We're going to be addressing those at the end. So don't be shy, throw them in. Um, we'll take those at the end for you. Okay, so now for those who are self-employed or have a little bit of a unique financial situation, what advice do you have for them when, when they're starting the, the process of getting pre-approved? Yeah, so easy one here. Start your approval process early because when you're a W-2 employee, it's very straightforward. It's what they call an A-plus file. It's easy, right? You have a box. It's box five of your W-2. That's what you make. You divide that by 12 there's your monthly income, right? When you get self-employed, not only is it, um, it's a little bit more of a story because you need to make sure like what expenses are you hitting against it? What line item do you use off your tax returns? But it's also a history. So 1099 self-employed uh, individuals, 1099 is also contractors. You need two years history. So let's say you're coming from a W-2 job. You want to start your own business. You also want to buy a house. You want to buy that house first because if you don't, you have to put in two years of history, else a bank won't take you. Caveat, there are different programs out there that will take what's called stated income, bank statement income, uh, bank statement loans. They exist. Usually they're at a much higher rate, higher risk. So it's not ideal, right? People kind of use them, talk about almost like a bridge loan and that it'll get you into the house. Um, but again, the main reason is getting of getting pre-approved early is it's not as straightforward always. Most people don't know about the history. And, and I understand the questions like, well, I've been doing, I was in the same industry. I opened my own business. I had a great first year. Why? I'm not the bank. I don't know, right? We don't make the guidelines. We're, we're enforced by them as well. So it's one of those things where I've seen many a times people have great W-2 jobs. Obviously, first year of the business is usually a little tougher because you're also putting money back into the business, right? You're trying to grow it. And in second year, you take off. So most people don't know about that history requirement, which is kind of big. Okay, thank you. I also just very quickly would love for you to recap the top three loan programs, along with the sure. minimum down payments and also closing costs that people should be aware of when they're um, starting to think about that mortgage loan. Sure. Okay. So the top three that most people have heard about are your your conventional, well, I'll dip into each one, FHA, first time home buying, and VA, which is military. So conventional is, that's what everyone knows is like, oh, I thought I needed 20% down, right? You don't. But that was kind of like the myth, right? That everyone everyone kind of buys by. So for conventional, you can put generally as low as 5% down, asterisk, sometimes 3%, which is income-based. But take income, take everything aside. The one number that everyone can put down the lowest is 5%. 
Um, FHA first time home buying, the lowest you can put down is three and a half percent. And then VA is zero percent for our military members. Um, mostly I'd say closing costs are the same. So we always say budget about two ish, a little over 2% for off your purchase price. It does vary because again, it gets pretty deep. Do you have an impound account or not? Which means you're paying taxes in your mortgage or you pay it outside. So there's a lot of little like avenues that dart off that would affect, oh, it actually it's only one and a half percent, right? But if if you say, hey, what cash do I need for a house? It's your whatever down payment you need, three and a half, five, zero, 15, 20, 10, plus the two percent. Um, but one thing I do want to mention there, Laura, is like, remember that, and this is the key of getting pre-approved too, is oftentimes it, it, it is a positive when you can put less money down because you, have, you keep more liquid capital in your pocket, right? But remember, your monthly mortgage is based off the loan size. So if you put more money down, the less your monthly is going to be. But this is where going through the pre-approval is very interesting because it might not be as much as you think, Right. So we have seen many instances in our process of people thinking they're not ready because they're trying to get that 20% mark, but then they see the difference of monthly of 10% or even 7%. You don't have to put a five or 10, you can put 7.7% down. Um, it's not hugely different. Um, so there's that. And then you said, um, oh, I want to mention about VA. VA is a little different because um, you can, well, you can get closing costs covered with all programs through something called a seller credit, which, you know, a key reason to talk to Laura and understand the market and how that works. Um, but oftentimes, I know a lot of VA clients try and go in with pretty much 0% down, uh, both in closing costs and down payment, right? So you buy a house with nothing and there's strategic ways to do that. VA and, and FHA, they're government programs. So there is something called a funding fee to both. So that gets either baked into the loan or your closing costs. It's not worth diving into right now. It's just something to know about. So when you talk to a lender, you can be relevant with the conversation, whereas conventional, there's nothing like that. Yes. Thank you. I appreciate you keeping it basic. I know there's many, many details to every yeah. type of loan. And again, it really depends on your um, personal situation, financial situation to, um, so you can kind of de decide which loan program is best for you. And Rob is obviously um, licensed and an expert in helping you decide that. Uh, but just in general, I did want to just throw in that as far as the real estate market um, in such a competitive market like San Diego, where we have very anemic inventory, very low inventory versus last year, um, while rates are still high or they're higher than before, coming in and talking to a seller and presenting yourself as a potential buyer, the pre-approval is crucial. Like it's almost like a seller and I, I'm, we can tell you this and can prove this because we work with 50% buyers, 50% sellers, a seller won't even consider your offer if you don't have that pre-approval letter. So think about it this way. You're going out to a, sh a shop and you want to go shopping and you put all these things in your cart, but you don't have a credit card or a wallet or any means of payment. You're not walking out of that store with anything. Um, so it's the same in, in real estate. You want to have that pre-approval. And again, going back to your personal and financial situation, you want to make sure that that pre-approval and that price range that you want to be shopping at actually equates to something that you can afford on the month on a monthly basis. A lot of people can get pre-approved for a lot more than they actually want to spend. And that's when we have that conversation with you to understand your, your lifestyle and what you can afford on a monthly basis. So can I say something here, Laura? Sure. Uh, just from experience and doing this a long time and us buying a house and going through it, knowing it inside and out, right? I've never seen a person who's not pre-approved go out and not want to buy a house, right? It's a very emotional process and it sneaks up on you. And it, it, there's something very magical about, you know, you're buying, especially a first house, right? You're buying your first house and you're like, oh, I'm just looking right now. And also you see something, you're like, got to have it, right? And you're not ready. And that's what Laura's getting into is like, again, it's it's a service to you. You know, and, and when you're not ready is when you buy something that overstretches you because you didn't think about it for enough time. And, you know, end of the day, like, sure, we want to sell you a house and get you into a house, but we're, we're people too, right? And, and we, we really care about the educational process. And um, we can't stress it enough how important it is to do it early and plan and be ready because that's where success stories start.
Yes. So let's switch gears a little bit. And again, drop any questions on the chat. We're going to be addressing them later. But let's talk about a different type of loan. Um, let's talk about a HELOC. And this one is more relevant to current homeowners. But if you're going to be purchasing a home in the future, you also care about this information. So a HELOC, home equity line of credit, how does it work? And can you define what it is? Sure. Okay. Definition, home equity line of credit, right? <laughs> so it's literally taking a line of equity against your house. What does that mean? You buy a house, 500000 Three years later, it's worth seven fifty, dollars right? So in theory, you have seven hundred fifty thousand of equity, which is that's not exactly true because it's based off your look. But in essence, you, you get two hundred fifty thousand so, of equity. I'm sorry. Sorry, go ahead. So, so you have you have equity, right? Did I say the wrong number? Sorry. Yeah. Um, so basically, that's cool and all, but like that's theoretical because you don't have any cash on hand, right? It's sitting in this theoretical analogy of what we think your house is worth. So what banks have done long, long time ago is allow you to leverage your home equity. So I'm sure a lot of us have heard of like reverse mortgages, which let's not even get into that. Um, cash out refinances, right? A home equity line of credit, you can kind of think of like a cash out refinance, but the beauty of it is, is that it's a standalone mortgage. So that means like a, a lot of people have bought their homes when rates are very low. So if you do a, a cash out refinance or refinance, that means you take the current market rate which you don't want if you have a low rate, right? So that doesn't make sense. So it's like, well, how do I tap into it? Well, this HELOC, Home Equity Line of Credit, will allow you to borrow a certain amount against your house, and it's all based off percentages. And it can be in the hundreds of thousands. And it's a second loan for whatever the going rate is. So it is a higher rate. But think about it this way. Would you rather, let's say you have a $400,000 loan and you want to take out 200000 So all of a sudden you have a $600,000 loan and you increase from 3.5% interest to 7.5%, right? Doesn't sound too sexy. But if you can keep your $400,000 loan and take out, right now it's about 10 to 11%. 11% off a smaller loan is not as exponentially as impactful as a larger loan. So it's really important that way. Um, I would say that... Think of it like, honestly, like a credit card. You know, a credit card has a limit, right? You have a $10,000, $20,000, $100,000 limit. It's the same thing as you're allowed to pull out a certain limit. You're allowed to borrow against that limit. And let's say you have a $100,000 limit, you use $10,000. That means you're only paying the interest off the $10,000 you borrowed, not the whole $100,000. So it's a beautiful thing because when you do a cash out refinance, let's say you're renovating your house, right? And you're like, I estimate I'm going to need 50,000, right? But that's over four to six months of paying contractors, right? But you have to take out the 50,000 up front. You're paying interest off the 50,000 all the way through, and then you're trying to pay it off. Whereas a HELOC, most times there's not a, a limit as to how low you can withdraw. Some banks there are, most there's not. So that means if I'm paying uh, Tyler 5,000, I can withdraw, pay the 5,000. I'm paying the interest off the 5,000, not the 50,000. So it's a very, very powerful tool. Okay. So with that, um, can you give us some examples of ways that a homeowner can leverage that HELOC um, towards potential other investments? Sure. Okay. So I guess like, well, not just investments, Laura, there, there are other ways to leverage it, right? Like debt consolidation is, a, is an equity leveraging tool. So let's say you are paying the minimum minimum of your credit cards and your credit card interest rate, usually they're minimum 18% to even 24%, right? So you could take out a HELOC at right now 11%. That's a heck of a lot less in, in interest, pay off your credit card and debt consolidate that way, right? Let's not forget, we have to pay it off, right? We get charged interest. But again, that's how you save money because these banks are in it for taking your money through interest and you're and it's to try to pay it off as quickly as possible. Um, another way is home renovations, right? So I kind of mentioned that, but a really good example in San Diego I love to give is the home renovation of adding an ADU, an additional dwelling unit. So here in San Diego, every residential home is allowed to have plus one unit that you can rent out. We all know rents here are pretty high in San Diego, right? So let's say you take out $150,000 to do this project, uh, which equates to about 1500 a month on a 30 year loan for this HELOC. So you, you'd pay, if you paid the minimum 1500 a month and for 30 years, you'd pay off your loan, right? Well, that $150,000 investment builds you a rental unit that brings you 2,500. 
So all of a sudden you're cash flowing a thousand dollars a month more. You put that into the, the, the HELOC payment because the idea is you want to pay off a HELOC as fast as possible because you want to reuse it. Right? So I, I did the math. If you did this exact scenario and put that extra thousand towards the HELOC loan, you'd pay it off in eight years. So that means you use none of your liquid cash, you use the cash of your home equity. You added value to your house because you increase the size. So whenever you do go to sell it, you have the house and an additional unit, which you put none of your money into. And then now you have a passive income after eight years that you're cash flowing straight. You know, so it's a great tool. And then the last thing I mentioned is um, investments, right? There's two types. There's buy and holds and there's flips. So buy and holds make sense, but just remember, you need to make sure you cash flow enough to pay your mortgage and your HELOC amount, right? Whereas the flip is the more straightforward one because you're flipping, trying to get in and out, in and out three to five months, and then you take the lump sum and pay off the HELOC. So maybe you pay, I, I didn't do this math, sorry, but maybe you pay like 4,000 in interest. And again, you took none of your money out of the bank. You paid all the contracts, you did the flip, you made the profit. So it cost you $4,000 to have $0 in your pocket to flip that house. So it's very powerful. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. I think you can actually share a real life example. So your sure. background, can you tell us about your background? <laughs> yeah. Okay. So for those that don't know, um, Laura and I have a passion in all things real estate beyond, you know, helping you guys buy a house. We, we also got into the real estate investment game a few years ago and we have two Airbnbs. So this one behind us, using a HELOC, we were able to purchase a 1928 cabin in Julian, California, which we now leverage for our clients, for Airbnb purposes, for ourselves, um, all through the power of a HELOC. Cool example. Um, somebody was actually asking um, a question related to HELOC. Mm -hmm. She's asking, what is the best, least expensive type of loan to update my home I think they mean to renovate, to upgrade the home. So I think. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. So you have to do research because the market changes every day, every week, every month, right? When you say least expensive by one to 15, like literally counting logically, a refinance is cheaper by the percentage of the interest rate, right? But it depends on your situation. Again, if you have an interest rate that is low threes, twos, that's very impactful to take, to change that whole entire loan you have off your house, plus a cash out to that new rate, right? HELOC, while it's a higher interest rate, if you were to run the numbers of a secondary loan, which is smaller, right? So this is 500,000, there's 150, right? Off a higher rate, by the numbers monthly, the HELOC would be a cheaper, better option and also less risky because cash out refinance you're stuck with that rate. HELOC, you can pay it off. And remember, you're only paying the interest off the principal that you take. Yes. So it comes down to your personal situation and how much you actually have of that mortgage payoff. Mm -hmm. um, but for most people, um, especially if you've only bought your home a few years ago, um, that HELOC is going to make more sense. Um, okay. Um, as far as HELOCs, anything, any misconceptions or any mistakes that people, that homeowners usually fall into um, when considering a HELOC or when getting a HELOC? Sure. Um, yep. Yeah. I would just say, remember, it still costs money, right? So sometimes I've heard people talk about like, oh, I'm going to use the equity in my house and purchase a home and hold on to it. Great. But just remember, you're, you still have to pay off the loan, right? So now you're paying off the home mortgage loan. You're paying off the loan you took for the down payment. Is that property cash flowing both those loans, right? Or if you look at debt consolidation, oh, I want to put this into my business or do this or that, right? You still have to pay it off, right? So uh, a HELOC costs about 2% up front. You don't have to pay it up front. It gets tacked into your total loan, right? So it goes into the monthly payment. But just remember, it does cost 2%, which which not much. That's less than going through purchasing a house, right? Um, but again, I just tend to think people forget, like it's an immediate repayment, a monthly repayment. So I just want to caveat star, remember, like you are being charged interest. We're not talking three, four, five percent. We're talking 10, 11 percent, right? Historically, it's still not a bad deal. You can make sense of it. You can make it work, but 
remember it's to be paid off. Yes. And I think um, just want to highlight for people on here and for anybody who watches this video, it's like this, if this is the first time you're hearing about this type of loan, don't feel like you need to figure it out on your own and figure out the numbers on your own. This is why we are here. This is why you have a team of experts. So please reach out to us with any personal financial situation that you have. And specifically Rob, he can help you actually run the numbers so that you can understand if something like a HELOC or a different type of loan would make more sense for you. Um, may, may I add, the process yeah. of the HELOC is actually very streamlined. Um, it runs off what we report to the government. So they have a tie into the um, .gov page. I forget what it is for taxes, irs.gov or whatever. <laughs> That's probably it, right? And basically, it literally streamlines, pulls your data, knows your data, and you'll know if you're approved in minutes. It's very simple. Cool. All righty. Well, maybe we should move on and take on some questions. I see a, a few questions on here. Um, is it better to use a conventional loan or first time homebuyers or FHA loan? Um, I heard some sellers would rather accept offers com from conventional loans. Yeah. So you actually reminded me one loans I didn't or a group of loans I didn't talk on are like grant program loans, which are also first time home buying loans. So we'll kind of touch on those here. I, I feel like that question is a good real estate question too, but I'll, I'll give my like realtor question, but I'll give my opinion. I, I Where the cor direction of the question is, you're not wrong, right? Like sellers are advised by seller agents. Oftentimes a straightforward conventional loan is like the easiest, less risky, right? But that's where you really have a team of experts because even a lender can do a conventional pre-approval wrong and it not go through, right? So that's what they're levying against is what is the risk that this buyer's loan won't get approved, right? So there's this stigma like, oh, well, you only do first-time home buying loans when you can't do a conventional. Not exactly true, right? There's some truth to it, but not exactly. There are still very strong first-time home buyer loans. This is where I have to go to that answer of like, it does vary per situation, right? So if you tell me you have a great credit score, high sevens into eights, um, decent down payment, most likely a conventional would make sense because of what mortgage insurance costs for FHA, the first time home buying. Um, I could show you on paper. In on the flip side, if you have a lower credit score, FHA would make a lot more sense because of how it impacts interest rate and things. So I'm going to turn it to Laura about the question of how it affects like the seller side. Yeah. And I think this is a, again, it really depends on the type of seller that we are dealing with. Right. And it really depends on how many offers this seller has. Um, I think that when we're representing a buyer, even if you have an FHA loan or you're using grants, we're going to put a package together. That's going to, you know, represent you in the best way possible. And we can't really, um, tell the seller what to decide on. Now, if a seller does have multiple options, usually most sellers will choose a loan that's going to go through faster. And that, yeah. yeah, so usually, um, you know, if a seller can close here in San Diego, we literally close homes in 10 days, 15 days. So if a loan comes in that can close that soon, they're probably going to opt for that type of loan because it can be a lot faster and they can get their money a lot faster because they probably need to do other things like buy a new house or move out of state. Um, so I would say that. And then also sometimes we could be competing with cash. That is like, there's sometimes a no brainer for a seller. Um, so I think it really depends and it really go, it comes down to me as the realtor representing you to find out as much as possible um, about what these seller motivations are and then present your offer package in a way that it's going to meet that criteria that they're looking for. Um, so that, that's what I would say there. It really depends. Some sellers will go with an offer that surprises us sometimes. So it, it's hard to tell, but overall, um, most sellers are going to want to close a lot faster and have very little up to none obstacles um, through the, the the escrow process. If I could add last topic to that is um, at the end of the day, your offer is your offer, right? And the seller is going to get that money no matter what program funds your loans, right? So it's also a matter of being educated and being able to put the message across of like, this will close, right? But another good example is um, FHA, VA, conventional, they all have different guidelines. And FHA 
using this as an example because it's a government sponsored loan or uh, loan program, they are stricter on the guidelines. So if you're buying a home that needs a little bit of work, sometimes sellers will steer towards conventional because FHA loan could call out like, well, we can appraise it, which means like it'll appraise the value you're buying at. Um, but you have to make sure the paint's not shipping. You have to do the X, Y, and Z, whereas conventional doesn't look at any of that, right? So that is one hard concrete answer, which would mean why someone would steer one towards the other. But again, yeah. it all goes back to the scenario, the situation, the seller, the house, the the person. It's a lot. Yeah, exactly. It comes down to that because are we able to help our buyers buy homes with FHA loans all the time, right? Mm -hmm. So it really comes down to the the specific situation there. Okay, how long does it take for a person who moves to the U.S. from abroad to build sufficient credit to get a pre-approval to buy a house? Yeah, I saw this question. I unfortunately don't have the answer to that because I'm not. That that's like a credit expert answer, and I. We don't dive into that. So I saw that and I was like, oh, I'm not going to be able to answer that one. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I guess some tips I could give is like start building your credit ASAP, right? Whether it's opening a credit card or being a secondary on a on a loan. Um, again, I don't know the algorithm behind what builds the credit. You know, I don't know what builds the quickest. I'm not sure if Laura, if you've heard from a real estate point of view, like in your network, but I, I unfortunately couldn't answer that one. Yeah, I think for that one, if you want specifics, a credit um, repair or credit specialist. Well, can I tell you what, let's, it. Um, we'll, we'll, but we'll, we ask, ask we'll circle question. back. Yeah, we'll circle back on that one. We're, we're happy to circle back there. Um, I know in general, um, for people that are moving from abroad or um, that are looking to kind of improve their credit very quickly, um, they usually end up working with a professional that it's in the credit industry, so credit specialist, um, and they're able to really pinpoint exactly the few things that you need to go through to get that credit score up. Um, so I would say having a conversation with a credit specialist will definitely be key there. Okay. Um, all righty, I think we are up on time, a little bit over. Thank you um, for, to everyone who stayed the entire time. We are going to be sending a replay recap replay of the of this session as well as the freebie rob do you want to share with us what is the freebie oh, yeah. um you want me to share it on the screen real quick um you can talk about it okay okay so basically um Laurie asked us to all have like a very nice uh resource for you guys and what i want to prepare for you um is a resource around the pre-approval topic because i i totally understand we kind of said in the beginning it's, it's very black or white you can't buy a house without one right but I understand it's an intimidating topic and one that's hard to breach. So this freebie is going to be a little cheat sheet that can help you understand on a very broad level, would I get pre-approved for a certain home? So it's an Excel example that will allow you to input what's your income, what are your debts, which remember, it's your creditor debts, not your utilities, not your groceries, not your fund bucket, what you owe to creditor, and it'll help you understand if you're approved or not. It is not a pre-approval asterisk star explanation is nothing like that, but it is a great starter kit to be, uh, to help you understand where you sit on the, on the situation. Great. So we are going to be including that in the recap. And again, thank you, Rob, so much for all of your insights, for all of the information. We truly appreciate it to everyone that has sent us, has attended the previous online series. Um, you have the replays and recaps for all of those as well. If you need any of those, or if this is your first time attending one of these, we've had three others with also great topics. So if you want to have access to those, please just message us. We are happy to provide those. Um, thank you so much for joining the series. We hope that we do more of these in the future and have a great night, everybody. And thank you, Rob, again. Thanks, Laura. See you, everyone.